whatever. It had to be something that I really liked. Um, so they told me this, you know, of course, growing up, like, you know, you know, I was just, I had a gift for music, and I always would pick out good music. I made my first tape when I was seven years old. The funny thing about it, what I used to do is I had this new bull box, right? CD player, I put a CD in, I had to skip through the song, I find a song I like, and then hit record on the set, because the car had a set, but we had a CD player at home. <laughs> so I used to always make the best CD and pick out the best song, pick out the best songs or whatnot. And so my dad was like, you really just love music. When I was four years old, I put together my, my first uh, stereo system. My dad was trying to fix the stereo, he couldn't get it to work. He had a survey with the red, the, the red ring around it on the survey. And um, I remember he caught me messing around with it and he popped me. Like he beat the crap out of me. <laughs> but at the same time, I turned the music on and it was working. I just knew what I was doing. So when I got, so when I got about like seven, when I turned eight years old, around that time, uh, I was always around the studios. My dad was managing producers. Oh, imagine eight producer by the name of Liz, producer for Keith Sweat, produced for uh, this group named, uh, used to be called Blitz back in the day, and then later became State of Mind. They all separated. One of them became successful, actually, uh, as an actor. Um, his name is Keith Robinson. He acted in Dream Girls, he played the guy who played the piano, he played the Bad Hour, 35 tickets, few movies or whatnot. So, you know, being around all of that, I was like, Dad, I want to be a producer. He laughed at me, he thought I was, thought I was funny. And, you know, I was really serious. When I was eight years old, uh, I remember, you know, I used to from here, so we used to live in Decatur, and in our house we had like a small studio for, the, for one of the producers that was.
me, I wanted to learn, but he gave me more of a challenge than everybody else. He said, if you really want to do it, then I'm going to give you these books to read. So I was like, why can't I just, why can't you just show me, why can't you just let me do this? Like, you know, like, you make it, make it so hard. So, he gave me the books, he said, all right, now, once I give you the books, I'm going to ask you questions about what my first equip, piece of equipment I had to learn to do with the NBC 2000, etc. He said, I'm going to give you a quiz, and I'm going to ask you questions about what this does and what does this mean, and you got to tell me, or she can't mess with my stuff. I was like, but she showed him, I said, no, it's your different. He said, I said, because you, all, cause you keep on asking me, I asked him at least about 10, 15 times. I want to do it, I want to do it, I want to do it. So, just took he, and he's a Libra, like myself. So, he picked on me a lot, because he felt like I was a fan. So, I learned it, and he said, got to score an eight or higher. So, he said, he asked me 25 questions. And out of that 25 questions, I got a B, and I was second. I'm like, man, but he's like, no matter what, though, she showed me that she really was a it was more so about you showing that you want to do this. So at 13, I made my first beat. I was like, oh, I'm about to go clap. I was already on the That was it. I was like, nothing was coming. I'm high. I'm, I'm about to go off. So yeah, I let my, uh, my dad like, hear some of my stuff. I was like, that I really want to produce. And he was like, he's like, you know what? If this was you really, you really serious about it because you've been talking about this for years, I said, yes, yeah, I really want to do this. He said, all right, cool. So he, Invested and bought my first drum machine, and that was it. Now, little do I know that the drum machine doesn't work without the sound module and the keyboard and <laughs> monitor and things of that nature. So I was putting this together. So I had to make do what I had. So with the NBC, I was able to sample like different old school stuff. I had to read the book again and learn how to sample and then make these off of that. But I could not play no keys. So I started selling snacks. In school, I was I was a snack guy. That's what, that's my job. That's what I work. I sold pretty much throughout high school. Is if you buy it, I'm supplying. That was <laughs> okay. Ask me questions. Now, when I, uh, I was selling all this candy and stuff like that. I was making you know some decent money. Went to high school and was doing the same thing. Now in high school, um, I ran across and met this artist. She was the best artist I've ever. Like even to this day, I still will put up against Drake and anybody that's like, I don't care. Okay. Probably not Kendrick. Kendrick's really dumb. I swear. <laughs> but um, he was like really talented. He had the same passion and drive as me. You know, he was always writing. At 13, he was he was a year younger than me. I was. I met him at 15. He was 14. And we met at this studio that my uncle used to own back in the day. And he also partnered up with uh, music producer Ray Murray from Organized Noise. And he was like family to me as well. Two minutes? All right, cool. He was like, he was like family as well. Um, learned a lot from him, so I was picking everybody. I was really good at picking everybody's brain about, you know, producing and stuff like that. Long story short, you know, me and the artists we met, we were passionate about the same thing. You know, my dad was my manager, he had somebody else as his manager. Over the time, me and my pops, we fell out when I was like 16. So, found out really that he wasn't my real biological father. Now, that did not make me hate him. That was not the reason. It was a lot of other stuff because I was really serious about this. And I felt like he invested more time into other things than, than something than me. You know, and when I met my real father, well, I knew him. I, when I was around him, I felt the same way about it. So, I felt like, you know, a people that was trying, like, he gave me, he started me, and it was up to me to finish. But because I'm a child, I'm like, you're supposed to help me do this for me. And it really built me a tough skin to really, you know, make it out on my own. So when I was really up under my, my, my pops like that, I was really at my mother's, and he was doing the same thing. Me and him built this relationship together that we want to make it. So then we used to record in my basement. You know, uh, 2006, we made a mixtape with 32 songs on it. It was like sneakers of freestyle and stuff. Second mixtape with a double this tape with 54 songs. Now, 2007, he made a song called My DJ and Jerron, which I'm pretty sure some of you are familiar with. It's an actual song. And I wasn't a real DJ, and I was just a producer. So what I did was, I, you know, was just like, I started DJing around that same time, just to put myself out as a DJ. 2008 came, so I made some success. 2009, I started DJing on radio. It was only been a year and a half of DJing, and I was already on the, on the radio. It was, God telling me, hey, this is, you know, your comment like this is what you're supposed to be doing. You'll see and things like that, but I'm also very passionate about my gift. So I use my gift as a 
my brain to push forward, this is, you know what I'm saying, to do what my calling in life is. 2010 uh, came around, I'm um, on everything. 2000, uh, December 2010, artist died in a car accident. Got hit by a rock. At that time, I went to sabbatical where I quit music. I just quit. Like, I had money to pay for my car notes and everything. I said, y'all can take care of it. I had bases, I had all kinds of everything. I was actually going to be on my knee, but I was still maintaining my stuff. I didn't care about anything no more. By 2011, I got back on my feet, you know what I'm saying? I bought my studio back, which I had bought in 2009, and I still have it now. It's called Headquarters Recordings. Um, started getting back in, then I was like, you know, how can I, I've been out for a while, how can I come back and make an impact? Because it's all about making an impact whenever you're brand new. Okay, I'm going to come on with a mascot, come on with my own app, which I didn't finish that. I came up with a mascot, you know, I just started, you know, reliving what it is that I want to do. So I came up with ways of how to do things that other people are not doing and make it an impact so that everybody can see it. Because it's like, you know, outside of my mind. So if people don't see me working or see that I'm actually doing it, then my work is pretty much dead. You know what I'm saying? So I just kept on going, kept on grinding, kept on just, up, you know, building up to, you know, where I am now. So now I'm in the studio, I DJ a lot of clubs and stuff like that. I still have a relationship with 1079. Um, I'm not on air anymore, but I'm still with Dirty Boys, of course. And, you know, from, from here on out, it's like, I don't have to try to compete with other, I don't have to try to compete with other people. You know what I'm saying? Because that's not success. Success is when you are competing with yourself and building yourself up. You know, and I always advise you don't ever compare yourself to the next person. You know what I'm saying? Because you are your own person. Always build with yourself. Don't worry about, you know, a horse doesn't bring his wings race by looking over at the next horse. He only can win if he looking straight ahead. So at that point, you just got to keep on growing and keep on grinding out. When somebody tell you, you know, that's more fuel energy for me to keep on going in my heart. It's like a fool, fool people on because I'm here. That's how I'm <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>